Welcome to another podcast of Gospel Entrepreneurs. We are thrilled that you're joining us again. And today, my special guest is Simon Berry, who actually lives in a beautiful part of the country up in the Lake District. I think one of his hotels, or maybe two of his hotels, overlook Windermere. So he's in one of the precious places, he would say. I'm sure he'd tell you that anyway. He's a hotelier. He's a gospel man through and through. And he's an entrepreneur. So I'm thrilled that Simon Berry is joining me today. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Roy. Simon, this is Gospel Entrepreneurs. Did you always own hotels? Did you kind of move into it? How did give us the story behind got you to where you are now? Well, the family's had interests in the Lake District since the 30s when my great grandfather um, moved the family out of Manchester to Blackpool and then to the Lake District uh, during the 30s when he could see the war coming. So there's always been interest up here, but I grew up in the Thames Valley. Uh, I'm a Southern boy, really. That's why there's no accent. But those early days, you know, living down there, I was thinking about it. I suppose, you know, are you born an entrepreneur? I don't know. You can definitely teach it, but I think there's got to be maybe a sort of a spark in there somewhere. I can't remember. I was thinking back, no one's going to do this. And my first um, sort of entrepreneurial bit of business was aged nine and 10 with my next door neighbor, whose mum and dad had a huge disused greenhouse and we grew little succulent plants, you know, those little things that, they grow quite easily. You just break a leaf off and stick it with a bit of sandy soil and they, they sprout. Then then my mum used to take them to the WI market stall and sell them for us. And uh, that, was, that was great fun. Um, I made a few pennies then. Probably my, my most successful business venture of my entire life was a boarding school um, brewing beer and selling it to the other boys. But probably won't go into too much detail about that. But myself and a couple of mates, we made a lot of money. <laughs> nah. and, and you obviously know how to brew beer then as well, Simon. Well, do you know what? I always re- I always wanted to own a little microbrewery. We've got one now, one of the hotels, which is great fun. <laughs> but, uh, but in those days, it was just a, it was a Boots brew kit. You know, in the 70s, you could go to Boots and buy the kit. And you had a bucket and we found a found a disused garage and made all the beer in there and um, sold it at school. So that, that was good fun. It's obviously in your DNA, Simon. It's just in you. Yeah, there's that streak in there somewhere. And then moved to the lake. I really didn't start working in the lake until um, mid-80s, having um, worked in London. Uh, I trained as a chef. I was always been a chef. My father was a chartered accountant. He was always in business and was very disappointed that I didn't want to be a lawyer or an accountant. I thought I needed a proper job. Um, but when I told him I wanted to be a chef, he got he got pretty dis- it was pretty disappointed. He said, you better get it out of your system. So I went to work in London as a chef. Uh, and that, those were in the days when, you know, the chefs were the sort of pop idols as they are today. You know, the, the, the greatest thing on TV was sort of Fanny Craddock and then, you know, maybe Graham Kerr for those who were old enough to remember. <laughs> but there was, there was no there was no uh, Gordon Ramsay or, or any of that carry on uh, as there is today. But, um, yeah, did the chefing and then moved back up to the lakes and uh, joined then what was a very small uh, family hotel business, which uh, we've grown pretty substantially since then. And, and were you, you joined that business as a chef or did you actually own it or how did it work? What's that happen? No. Well, yeah, the, the, the ownership was actually in family ownership. In fact, by a quirk of fate or whatever you want to call it, God's providence, the, the business actually was left to myself and my brother. It missed a couple of generations and um, really took the business on. So, yeah, I, I, gave, I stopped chefing. In my early 20s, my wife and I went out to New Zealand, Australia, and we, that's where we became Christians, got saved out there, um, lives sort of radically transformed, uh, which is a whole other story. But came back and decided we better come and find out what this business up in the Lake District was all about, and it seemed like a good idea to stay and um, and turn it around. I mean, my father had done a lot uh, to sort of professionalise the business, but it's still quite a cottage industry uh, back in the in the early 80s. And did you, you knew something because you've done chef, uh, but obviously running a hotel is a little bit different to, I mean, food's obviously a critical part of it, but. Uh... Yeah, my, my chef in Korea, uh, Dan, I worked at Savoy Hotel Company, so working mainly at the Savoy, Claridge's, the Barclay, a little bit at the Connaught in London, orig- starting off chefing and then went into management um, and worked my way through the whole sort of management of the, the hotel. 
and um, so I learned all those things. Came up to the lake, dad got his way and said, right, you're going to do the accounts. So I did those for three months and said, if I do another month, I'm leaving. I'm not doing that another month. <laughs> I, I now know how to read a profit loss on a balance sheet. I'm not doing it. I'm not making one up again. I'm just going to read it. So um, the early career really was in the, in the sales uh, side of things and making sure we had business coming in which I really enjoyed and, and still, still do enjoy, although I'm, I'm not quite as involved as I was then, back then, but it's good fun. And obviously you had one hotel, I'm assuming. Now I think you've got four or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, it's funny because you look at it and you think, actually, we've had other properties that have come and gone, but the core of the business has stayed very strong and continue to invest in it. We've just uh, given up on, on one property, but we've got two other hotels that were in the in the pipeline at the moment so um it grows and it develops and it matures and i mean fundamentally we've, we've repositioned the business very significantly over the last few years in terms of of the market that we appeal to and and push the product if you like more uh, i don't want to say up market but yeah basically it's more expensive now than it used to be because you know you've got to we, we want to pay people really well and if you want the best staff and you want to pay them really well you have to charge accordingly or you you dumb down the services and there is you know there's definitely a place in the in the hospitality business for the likes of you know the travel lodge and the premier in with you know with very little um sort of human interaction and that's how you reduce your costs and and keep the prices down but uh, we don't want to be in the squeezed middle you either have to you have to go for excellence and and go for the sort of mid to top end or you have to go right down and cut all the services out cut the costs out um both models work what what tends not to work is the it's the very labor intensive middle of the road where but you can't charge the price because the perhaps the quality's not there. So yeah, we've invested massively in the hotels, um, you know, new spa facilities and yeah, huge amounts of stuff done. And Simon, obviously, how do you bring the gospel values into that business and you know, obviously generating income, uh serving a very Nice clientele, obviously, the position you're in. But also you're a local church leader in the local church. Uh, you've been involved in the community. How do you hold the gospel values around the way you do business and the way you live life? It, it comes down, I suppose, to trying to live out a life of integrity, both in your work life and your personal life. You know, in any community, you know, in the, in the middle of a huge urban sprawl or, or here in the Lake District. People, people tend to know who you are and um, they get to know what you stand for. So, you know, I can remember, um, as you know, I'm involved with the Plough Ministry and Louise saying to me years ago, um, Simon, you're the only Bible most people will get to read. Make sure, make sure you're, you know, you, you're actually presenting the gospel in everything that you do and live. And, you know, hey, listen, you know, we're all sinners saved by grace and I definitely don't get it all right. But, you know, there have been, you know, many instances. People know what you stand for. So how you deal with suppliers, you know, you, you pay them on time and you play, pay them properly. And when they do, even when, it, even when it's really, really tight. And believe me, you know, there have been a number of occasions when, you know, myself and my brother, we've not taken any salary because we needed to pay the staff. You know, it's not all it's not all being uh, playing sailing. There are times when it's tough. But you make those decisions based on um you know, the, the wristband, you know, what would Jesus do? I don't wear one, but I try and think about it. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, yeah, living, living out, living out the, 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 the honesty and the truth of the gospel because people are watching, you know, whether you think, you know, I, for years I thought, oh, nobody, nobody really knows I'm a Christian. And then, you know, a couple of little instances, you know, you think, oh, they actually do. <laughs> that's really, that's really funny. And, and in the last three years, or oh, last few years should i say you you've obviously had a massive building project that i know was a bit of a challenge for you and then covid which must have hit the hotel industry massively i'm sure that stretched your faith and your prayer life but how was that for you and how did you journey through that because people responded differently but for you it must have been a massive challenge it's an interesting one because you know you forget oh well, i do anyway i forget you forget so quickly what it was like but just, just sort of thinking through so yeah we had a huge building project should have cost 12 million ended up costing 18 million should have should have been finished in 12 months it took nearly two years so that was pretty challenging you know those things stretch your faith we just literally you know months got that finished sort of late summer early autumn of 19 and then the pandemic hit i remember that first 
you know, that Friday when uh, the prime minister made the announcement, we'd actually had a board meeting that morning and thought something's going to happen. Got home, turned the news on, watched that and thought, gosh, right. So on the phone to the other directors, we all went to different hotels. I was down at the largest hotel, Lowood Bay, pulled the management team together. And, you know, it was, it was a, a real roller coaster. And, you know, there was quite a lot of tears, you know, some of the staff were in tears. Uh, you remembering, you know, on that Friday, no one had come up with a, any kind of, you know, furlough scheme. Nobody had come up with, you know, you're going to get your rates <laughs> rebate. Um, you know, so none of those things had happened, you know, and we were all making it up as we went along. We had to go and tell the guests they, they couldn't even have breakfast the following morning. They all had to go home, you know, which was crazy. I can remember taking, there's there's a couple of um, residential centres here in the lakes, as there is everywhere, and we just loaded vans full of food and they they, they were eating lobsters and, and fillet steaks for the next week or two because they otherwise it was going to get thrown away and it was crazy. We were fortunate, you know, obviously the government came with the schemes, most of which worked well for us as an industry. So we were able to kick virtually everyone. I think they were, I'm trying to work it out. I think we had six redundancies out of a workforce then of equivalent 400 full-time employees. So we managed to keep everybody on. Yeah. And then reopen and then closed and reopen and closed. That was, that was tough. That was really tough on the team, to be honest, you know, and, and, you know, when you look around and you hear some of the stories of people struggling with, you know, uh, mental health issues. Yeah. I could see where a lot of those came from, came from and come from. If I had no faith, I don't know where we'd have, where we'd have been to be honest, uh, cause there was some interesting days for sure. Yeah, it must've been. And often we kind of think, Hey, it's amazing to have the opportunity and privilege or responsibility of running a business. But when something like this kicks in, because you care about people, because you hold certain values, it must have played, taken its toll on you, Simon, did it personally and where you were at? Did it take its toll on me? I suppose it did, although I'm pretty resilient. One of the greatest things, actually one of the things I'm really pleased about in a way is in my early, my very early business career, uh, we had, if you remember, Black Wednesday and interest rates going to 18%. Those were really, really tough days. I mean, my father was still involved. I wasn't running the business at the time, but um, just about to sort of start taking over. And going through that was really tough. And I can remember thinking, actually, that stood me in really good stead in terms of both my faith, my prayer life. I can remember at the time, I mean, I don't think my brother had given his heart to the Lord at the time. My dad definitely hadn't. And my dad saying to me, call him in the office, said, you, you better get onto the phone to that God of yours because we're going to need some help here because we're right in it. You know, he used to say, we're all in it. It's just the depth that varies. But believe me, we, we were in it deep then. So actually, one of, the, one of the strange, odd blessings of this pandemic, although we've come out of it financially, you know, very well, God's been so good, actually is that the next generation coming up into the business both family and non-family have had this early in their career, you know, and I, I, any, any entrepreneur who's not had it really hard, really early, it's a blessing. And, you know, you need to take it as a blessing and, and get you get through it. And sometimes you don't, but if you get through it, you will learn so much and be so much more resilient and, and you'll see the hand of God in so many ways. You mentioned resilience probably three times in that last little piece. How does someone be resilient when some of these big challenges, because a lot of people, resilience is only tested when you're in it, isn't it? You don't really know whether you will be resilient, but how do you build the muscle so that you're going to survive or even thrive within that? And sometimes the entrepreneur, when these things happen, I'm sure you thought the same way, they tend to think, oh, we've got to do things differently now. There's, there's got to be another opportunity that will come out of this and we need to think differently. Yeah, I, I suppose if you sort of dig down deep into the mindset of someone who's a classic entrepreneur, whether they're you know full time ministry and there's some amazing entrepreneurs in full time ministry, or running a business, or even just the way you you lead your life, it's about actually enjoying and embracing change and enjoying and embracing challenge. And I think if you do, whether the challenge and the change is is forced on you. Uh, by outside circumstances or whether you choose to create it yourself if you enjoy that if you're prepared to um, embrace that and look for what are the positives in it what are, what are the upsides then you are naturally going to be more resilient how do you build the muscle for it well obviously going through it a few times builds builds muscle um, and you learn and that's why as i was saying having 
having some of the youngsters going through it early on in their career is really advantageous because there will be another crisis. You know, there will be something tomorrow. You know, it's, it's energy at the moment. You know, our energy costs and travel, you know, and so on and so forth. You can't just, you know, put your price up by three times. So, you know, when those challenges come, being in a place where you, you've experienced it and you know, you know, almost instinctively what, what to do is really helpful. And um, other than that, I think really it's just a question of, having certainly as a christian that complete faith that god's got a perfect plan and i'm just going to walk in it and seeking his guidance his wisdom on a, on a daily basis having good men and women obviously around you both within the business and we have a few other uh, senior members of the team who are christians but they're not all they they love that about who we are but also outside the business you know friends and mentors and people you can just pick the phone up to and say uh, you know, what are we doing Type stuff really important. And Simon, I know you're also involved in a local church. So you were going to be getting a building and that didn't happen. And there was some dreams there. So it seems like you're applying this entrepreneurial gift in a church setting as well as a business setting. Some people seem to compartmentalize those things. You haven't done that. You've brought both into those settings, haven't you? I, I'm not uh, able to compartmentalize anything. I don't, <laughs> I'm very untidy. Everything blurs into one. So, yeah, uh, Elder and Local Church, we thought we were buying a building. That fell through. God shut the door the week before COVID. We'd been renting it for 10 years, so we didn't have to pay rent for 18 months. Praise the Lord. That was incredible. Two weeks later, pastor of another small uh, church in the town rang us up and said, uh, we want to give you the building. We've been praying about who should have it. Um the last five years we wanted to give it you guys so we got so yeah we, we didn't buy a building we saved 18 months rent we got given a building which we're now redeveloping it's almost finished we're opening a uh what we're calling the mission cafe on the ground floor which is a you know really high quality uh but not charging you know tourist prices uh serving the local community and where we are it's exciting because there's nothing else around it you know you think Wyndham is full of you know, cafes and restaurants and, and bars, et cetera, which it is. But this church building is right in the middle of the sort of urban sprawl of Windermere where, where the locals live. So, yeah, we're excited about that. It's um, challenging some of the <laughs> some of the rest of the team who perhaps don't know as much about the industry as I do are quite surprised at how much there is to actually do <laughs> setting up, you know, what we think was a small business, but uh, it's quite complex. But, yeah, it's fun. Simon, you've obviously done this a number of years. If somebody's listening to this and kind of thinking, hey, your dad kind of had it, you took it on, you've obviously invested, what would you say to them that, that kind of think, hey, I think I'm a gospel entrepreneur. I've heard a number of these podcasts. Now I hear Simon. He's kind of, even now you're saying you'll let one hotel go, but you're taking on a couple more hotels. What would you say to them? Because you, you started small, you know, the pot plants, but the DNA was in you. Just how would you encourage them? As we kind of come into land a bit, Simon, I want some of your wisdom to the younger audience and what you would say and what you would give to them at this point. There's a number of things, and, you know, there's, there's any number of, you know, books you can buy and read. But fundamentally, if you've got a dream, if you've got a passion for something, then run with it you know, go, go for it. Don't be afraid of taking risks. If, if you're afraid of taking risks, you're probably not going to make it. Don't be afraid of taking risks. The most important thing you can do though, is seek godly wisdom, uh, from older men and women, preferably people outside of full-time ministry. And that's not to say that your pastor or your church leader isn't going to be a, a great mentor. They are in many, many ways, but actually you want to find some Christian businessmen or women who've been through it that, that will you know support you and mentor you and, and ask those tough questions and, and please you know if you're listening there if you think about starting a business don't do it because your mum says it's the best thing you could ever do because unfortunately mums tend to love you and uh, they'll tell you you're going to be you know you're going to be the next Richard Branson and you may be but you may not be so ask some people who may be a bit more honest with you um, about about the quality of the idea I, I'm mentoring a, a guy at the moment He's got sort of four business ideas and it's really exciting because, you know, any one of them could be the right one. So trying to work out with it, which one is the, is the one to really go for and to, to put all the, because you can't do four. So um, find some great godly men or women who are in business, uh, who've been through it, 
who can impart some of their wisdom. And you, they will, they will be there. They will be there. Just ask around, even if you don't know them, and uh, and don't rely on your family and friends to tell you you're, you're brilliant. <laughs> Simon, uh, there's no escape from risk, though, is there? And there's no no escape from this kind of resilience. And we romanticise that we see the end result of where people are successful or faithful. But the journey to get there is really what they don't always hear about. Absolutely. You know, the journey is actually what it's all about, because at any particular point in time, you're on that journey. And, you know, we've had some really, really tough days. I mean, you know, days when you know, the, the bank wanted to literally take the keys and you know, close up. And think, this is it. COVID and in- interest rates and other, you know, all sorts of other issues along along the line. But sticking to it, it's really important if you're in business to remember who you're doing it for. Ultimately, you're doing it for the Father. You're doing it for God so you can be generous, you can give. And again, I would encourage any young businessman or woman or old businessman or woman, to remember to focus on the generosity of why you're in business, which is, you know, providing great jobs, fantastic, being able to give into, you know, good works and the ministry uh, in particular. But above all that, you've got to be able to think, why am I doing this? Who am I serving? And, you know, you've got, you've obviously got your customer base and you have to be the best at what you do for your customer base, whatever it is, making greetings cards, making orange juice. I don't know what you do, whatever it is you're doing, being the best and better than the best for your, for your team, whether that's, you know, one person or, or 400 or 4,000, be the best you can be for for your uh, team. And the one area that often gets forgotten is be the best and the greatest witness to, to your other stakeholders, those are your other investors. And I don't mean people put money into the business. I mean, your suppliers, uh, your bank, do you give them accurate numbers on a regular basis? And if you do, I tell you now, when the you know rubber hits the road, they'll believe you because you've given them accurate numbers as you've gone along. You know, the local community, all those are so important, you know, as a, as a young entrepreneur or any entrepreneur. And a gospel entrepreneur, because we're representing our Lord Jesus Christ, that that we're completely transparent and uh, upfront with all those, all those folk. And you know, it when when the tough times come, and believe me, they will. That emphasis that you put into that will will pay you back. Your team will be with you. Your customers will almost certainly be with you, and your stakeholders will definitely be with you if you've looked after them. Amazing. There's some real gems there, Simon. And I know that you served the community. I think you were high sheriff for a year as well, where you just went around and blessed it. You've obviously been recognised in the community, and it, it's a mark of your faith, what God's done for you, God's favour. So thanks so much, uh, Simon, and we really appreciate that. Fantastic, Roy. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This is another Gospel Entrepreneur podcast in partnership with UCB and Revelation Trust. We really appreciate you listening. If you want to make any feedback or comment, we'd love to hear that. And wherever you listen, do listen and pass it on. God bless you.